Yeah, thanks a lot for the invitation. Always a pleasure to be back. Um, yeah, so the talk uh, today will be about um, some naturally op occurring um, collection of random curves. Uh, and then we'll sort of see some geometric approaches uh, to study their fluctuation behavior. And all of this is um, joint work with uh, Milan Thetley, who was a former student at Berkeley and, and is now a uh, postdoc at Columbia. He's supposed to be here at some point. Right, so <clears throat> just to sort of set the stage, uh, so line ensembles are a family of random curves which occur in many national contexts. So um, some canonical examples including, include height functions in random growth processes, uh, such as polynuclear growth. And then you can also look at some lattice surface models and, 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 and look at contours, uh, which are the boundaries of level sets of the associated height functions. Uh, for example, occurring in models such as solid and solid models, uh, three-dimensional easing model, and although they often come as a family of curves, um, the top curve is usually the most important, right? So we'll see some examples of that. In particular, uh, one of the key um, curves that we will sort of focus on um, is given by the solution to this uh, stochastic PD known as the Kordor uh, uh equation. It's a nonlinear stochastic PD and it's supposed to um, um, sort of describe a planar random growth in a large class of uh, models. And so it's not super important to know the exact form, but you should think of H as this sort of randomly growing sort of curve. And H, T, X, X is a spatial coordinate. It's, it's one dimensional and T is the time coordinate. And, 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 and this is what the evolution looks like. So the time derivative is there is a Laplacian term here um, there's a gradient squared term, which is a key nonlinear term here, and, and this is driven by uh, space time white noise. Now you can sort of see that this already is somewhat hard to make sense of, because usually because of this white noise term, you expect even if there is a solution, it should be quite rough, in which case um, the gradient of air, the gradient of the height function in space can only be made sense of in a sort of distributional sense. And so, so squaring that is a problem. Um, uh, anyhow, so, so there has been a lot of developments in trying to make sense of this, in, in particular uh, sort of high risk regulatory structures, but much of the probabilistic analysis actually uh, focuses on uh, what is known as a Kohlhoff solution. So what does that do? Uh, so it basically exponentiates that. So if you think of H as log of Z, then Z actually satisfies a linear stochastic PD. It satisfies the stochastic heat equation with multiplicative noise. And, um, and, and then you can formally sort of take log and, and see that um, Z, if Z satisfies this and formally H satisfies this. Anyhow, so Z actually has a probabilistic interpretation. It, it does turn out to be um, the partition function of some uh, continuum polymer model, right? So, it's, so this is basically um, the log of this function is what we will basically look at. And uh, the fundamental solution corresponds to the initial condition Z at time zero being the direct mass at the origin. And this is what is known as the narrow width solution. And uh, while this is perhaps the most important case, the, the techniques that we will sort of talk about will allow us to treat a large class of initial data. Okay, so some properties of the height function H, so it grows linearly in time. And the fluctuation behavior is dictated by what are known as this KP's exponents. In particular, this means that um, at any given location, the, the value of this, this is a random variable, this fluctuates. So the leading order term is linear in T and the fluctuation is of order T to the one third, all right? And then if you measure the spatial correlation of this process, you see that the correlation is only sort of seen at scales, which is order T to the two third, right? And, and so we will sort of work with order one object. So we will sort of center scale um, the height function accordingly. So this is what we will look at. So HTX is a sort of scaled centered object. Uh, it's not super important to look at the precise details, but what you do is, is scale, uh, scale the space according to T to the two thirds, subtract of the leading order term and then divide by the fluctuation term. And so this is the scaled narrow width solution. So any questions about the object? All right, so some further properties. So it's known that this thing has a global parabolic behavior. And for and and but if you subtract up the parabolic term, this turns out to be a stationary process for any t. Okay. Now, 
large deviations are generally tail behavior of HTXs of significant interest. It turns out to have a lot of applications. So for example, certain key questions include what is the probability uh, of the height being a particular value at a given point? So, so let's say fix zero. So what is the probability that the height function at, time, at location zero is bigger than theta? Or more generally, you can also look at multi-point probabilities. You can take two points, zero and let's say one. What is the probability that it's bigger than theta one at zero and bigger than theta two at one? And, and, and further, you can ask what is the behavior of the height function if I condition on events of this kind, right? So in spite of significant progress, uh, sharp results are mostly missing. And, and particularly, although there's been some progress for narrow edge it, uh, for, for general data, um, it's, it's uh, much, much less known. And, and all the approaches so far use um, some pretty exactly solvable methods like reliance on some um, exact expressions in terms of Laplace transform, some PD methods, some Feynman cat representation and so on. And again, as I said, uh, most of the stuff is also sort of, most of the literature is also focused on one point tails. So we are looking at height functions. So we ideally would want to understand the joint distribution, but most of the current methods only allow you access uh, to one point behavior. Um, okay, so, so you should think of, so there was a time parameter in the description. So you should think of T as some temperature. So you can try to take the infinite temp, uh, zero temperature limit. Uh, so, so T should be thought of as an inverse temperature. So T going to infinity in some sense implies the temperature going to zero. And so it has long been conjectured and recently proven in two simultaneous works by Postel and Sarkar and, and by Balin Virag that the narrow width solution HT zero of the KP's equation as t goes to infinity, converges to what is known as the parabolic area two process. Okay, so what is this? So this turns out to be the scaling limit of um, Dyson Brown in motion. So let's say you have an n by n Gaussian matrix, and let's say the entries of the matrix evolve as Brownian motions. So that will make the eigenvalues evolve, and so this is the eigenvalue process. So the, the top curve traces the trajectory of the largest eigenvalue, and so on. And so if you look at the top line and scale it appropriately. This is what it converges to, right? So, so the zero temperature limit of the KP's equation is a scaling limit of this uh, Dyson Brownian motion process. And this is significantly easy to analyze because of the random matrix connections. So, the parabolic area two process, um, a lot more is known about that. In particular, it's known that the one point distribution of this process is what is known as a free Savidum distribution, which com comes up as the scaling limit of the largest eigenvalue of a Gaussian matrix. Okay, so the moral of the story is that you have this connect uh, related um, two processes. One of them uh, in particular is determinantal um, and allows more analysis, uh, but you should expect similar behavior for all large enough times. Okay, so this is a brief history, which is, in, which is by no means sort of complete. So, so the left-hand side of the slide sort of looks at developments in the zero temperature setting, and the right-hand side is about the positive temperature case. So the, so the work going back to Tracy and Widom focused on the behavior of the parabolic area two, or generally the Tracy Widom distribution and the tail behavior of that, uh, both upper and lower tails. So Timo Sepalainen proved large division um, estimates for models of a similar nature in the KPZ universality class. And then there was work by Deutschel and Ofer Kim, Johansson, and then very precise estimates about the tail of the Tracevitum distribution was obtained in works of Ryder, Ramirez, and Barag, and then follow up work by Dumas and Barag. Okay, so on the other hand, if you look at the positive temperature side, most of the results about tail bounds are not sharp and they are also not uniform in T until very recently when Corwin and Coastal uh, appeared, uh, obtained um, some uniform in T estimates, although they did not have sharp exponents in the, in the tail. And very recently, Carvin and Ghoshal obtained um, uh, a sharp understanding of the tail behavior uh, without understanding precisely the coefficients in front of that uh, using rather integrable methods. Okay, so again, the model of the story is much less is known on this side than the left-hand side. Okay, so this is the result that I was mentioning. So Dumas and Virag showed that if you look at the trace, so P is the zero temperature line ensemble. So, or the area two process. P zero is the trace evidence distribution. So P zero bigger than theta, the probability decays as exponential 
of four over three theta to the three by two plus some correction term, which is polylog. Okay, so this is sort of a random matrix type result. Largest eigenvalue of a Gaussian matrix has this sort of a theory. Yeah, so I mean, there, there is an infinite line ensemble and then you can sort of look at the joint distribution as a function of C and then you can send T to infinity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So here, it, yeah, you can just look at, there is an infinite, yeah, there's a zero temperature object, well-defined, which I mean, like only until recent, I mean, only recently it was known that the positive temperature converges to that, but you can independently define this object as scaling limit of eigenvalue, this Dyson Brown in motion. And for that process, you can just look at this problem. And it turns out that, yeah, it is an important point that um, you cannot just use this result uh, to argue about positive temperature, particularly uniformly in T. Yeah, and, uh, but even here in the zero temperature case where all of this random matrix stuff is known, uh, even here, the sharp multi-point asymptotics do not seem to be available. So if you just look at the top process in this Dyson Brown in motion ensemble, and this is a result about one point, but if you look at multiple points, it's still somehow, I mean, there are sort of exact formulas, um, but they don't seem to be very analyzable. Okay. All right, so for positive temperature, this was this sort of progress made by Carvin and Ghoshal who showed that for uniformly in T, um, the probability that the height function at zero is bigger than theta has a similar behavior, at least in terms of exponents. So theta to the three by two upper and lower bounds, the constants are off. And, and this sort of holds for a large class of initial data, not just the narrow range. Again, this, this, this proof relied heavily on an exact representation of this in terms of a Laplace transform of some determinable point process. And the constant here as well is predicted to be four thirds as in the zero temperature case in the physics literature. And this paper does prove that in, for the narrow wedge case in certain regimes. So, so, the, so the basic expectation is that for all large enough T uniformly, you should have um, the zero temperature behavior. The correction terms might vary, but uh, yeah. And so, so what we will do is sort of develop a unified sort of geometric approach, which will yield optimal results at one go for positive temperature, zero temperature, and, and, and and as I sort of indicated, some of these processes that I've talked about still have some connection to sort of integral models like random matrices. However, the, res the arguments actually are completely robust. So they will extend much beyond that. And we'll sort of uh, indicate some of those settings at the end. Okay, so this is the sort of main result. Um, so this is with Millen. So if you look at the density, so, so the first statement is about the density, which obviously implies the upper tail estimate. If you look at the density um, of the height function at zero um, at theta to theta plus d theta, it's like exponential in minus four thirds theta to three by two plus some correction term um, that's not super important and, and likely not sharp. In particular, you can just integrate this out and get the same bound for, for the upper tail. And um, so okay, some comments about the result. So, okay, so um, first let me pause. So any questions about the statement or the setting? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this is the Kohlhoff solution. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it is log Z. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so this is the quantity parts are not sort of recently spelled out, but yeah. Uniformly for T, and this is true. Let's say for all T bigger than one. Actually, the behavior is somewhat different when T goes to zero. So there you don't actually have uh, KPZ behavior, uh, somehow the Gaussian behavior dominates. Um, oh, with C. So here, oh no, so this, this, oh, I see, you mean the correction term. So the correction term is likely not even sharp, so. Yeah, so some of the focus was more on the leading under term. Other questions about the statement? Okay, so some comments. So sharp bound for the density. Um, and so actually no bounds on the density were available before, even though there were some tail bounds. 
Um, yeah, so holds for all large values of theta with the optimal coefficient of four thirds, which we sort of pointed out. Error bound is uniform in T. And the bound also holds for the zero temperature model. So, um, so this was already known as I pointed out by this result of Virag and Dumas and company, but the density bound even in this setting appears to be new. So even for the parabolic area two process, um, a density bound was not known. It turns out that this sort of uh, a common set of set of arguments imply the same for a large values model. Yeah. So at this point, narrow wedge. At this point, so eventually we'll sort of talk a little bit about other other details. And uh, yeah, so right here. So we'll describe similar results for general initial data as well as purely non integrable settings. So I'll, I'll, I'll be more precise about what I mean by this, but, uh, but some of the basic message is that the arguments are very probabilistic. Okay, so and the next sort of set of geometric questions that you can ask is what does the function look like if I tell you that it's very high at, at the origin? So what is the what does HT look like when HT zero is conditioned to be bigger than theta? And so, uh, um, so the basic um, statement is that this is true. So, so, so the top line, so the blue curve should be the top line. So the blue curve is somehow near theta at the origin. And then somehow it looks like a tent until the point at which it is tangent to this parabola, uh, which is y equal to minus x square. Okay. And then from then on, it sort of follows the parabola. That's roughly the shape theorem. Okay. And so these are, and so that's why the name tangent method appeared in the title. Uh, this is um, the sort of the tangency locations determine what the limit shape is. Okay. And so one way to sort of think of this figure is the convex hull of this point and the parabola. Okay. So you have the parabola that was the sort of the typical behavior. Um, you push, push this point up to theta. And now the limit shape becomes a convex hull of this two. Any questions about this? Okay. And um, I mean, like, so again, this is not super important to stare at, but this says that this height function condition to be, I'm mean, like, if you look at the conditional height function, this minus this 10 type figure is sort of small uh, with some Gaussian tail. And this is optimal because of reasons that will be clear soon. So I'm mean, like, again, it's not super important, but this is the basic point is that this is sort of the limit shape. And again, from this figure, it actually sort of turns out to be quite easy to sort of see where the four third constant comes from. And we'll soon see that. But okay, before that, so as I said, like even though there were some tools to handle one point estimates, um, multi point properties are completely out of reach. And so you can ask this question. So, so one particular property that these sort of height functions possess is the FKG inequality or positive association. So if I sort of force a point to be large, it overall increases the height function, so which means that it's also gonna be likely to be large at other points. So in particular, if I pick two points, X1 and X2, and then look at the property that the height function at X1 is bigger than A1, let's say, and the height function at X2 is bigger than A2, then the property is at least the product of the property. This is just basic FKG inequality. And now you can wonder whether this estimate is ever sharp. And um, so it turns out that um, the sort of geometric approach turn, uh, gives you a very precise answer to this question. Um, so if you look at the two point limit shape, uh, let's say for, for concreteness, fix the points to be minus one and one, and I want the height function to be bigger than A at minus one and bigger than B at one, then the limit shape looks like this, okay? Again, as you can see, the tangency points appear, and this is again, like the one point case, the convex hull of this parabola with these two points. Okay, so that governs the limit shape when you have this two point um, event. Any questions about this? Yeah, so basically you take the convex hull of, um, it's a good way to think about this is you look at the parabola and the two points. So the convex hull will be the straight line between these two points and the sort of line which sort of kisses the parabola on this side and the parabola on this side. And so somehow, so the convex hull will be a parabola beyond this tangency locations and this sort of piecewise linear function between those two tangency points. Yeah, so, so that's the point. So you can sort of basically this approach allows you to um, sort of 
at least in principle, although the probability expressions become more and more complicated, but it does give you in principle a way to compute this multipoint probabilities. So this is just coming from FKG for Brownian motion. Uh, got uh, maybe not. Uh, so okay. So yeah. So it will be clear in the slide. So so this is sort of a general two point case, and I did not comment yet on the FKG question that I asked in the previous slide. But somehow this figure will allow us to sort of see when is FKG sharp, and we will sort of see what a version of that will be for endpoints. Okay. Again, you have a similar. So this basically says what the shape theorem is: the height function minus this quadratic function is small throughout. Again, it's not very important to look at this expression. Question? Uh, and, and the same results hold also for the zero temperature case or the parabolic area too. Okay, and, and, and so this shape theorem actually allows us to compute the probabilities because um, of certain Brownian-ness in, in, in the systems. Okay, and so again, uh, before getting to that FKG question, so just to comment about the results. So this is a four sharp asymptotic results for two point distributions, even for the zero temperature case. And, um, and the probability is the, I'm like, I just showed you a shape. So you still have to compute the probability of that shape occurring. And, and somehow the probability actually depends on the, exactly the heights of the two points in a way which you will soon see. And as sort of was pointed out, this, this method can be extended to multiple points. Okay, so just to sort of um, talk about that dependence on the heights at different points. So suppose I force this point to be at A and force this point to be at B. And let's say the tangent from this point um, was such that this point was inside this tent shape. Then already you see that forcing this point to be at this height already implies that this point is a height even bigger than B. Okay, so, so I want the two points to be at height A and B, but if A is much higher than B, already the tent from A, uh, in, which looks like this, will sort of include B inside it, which means that um, the limit shape theorem for one point tells you that the height at this point will already be at this line, which is above B, okay? So somehow these two point properties are interesting only when A and B are, none of them is much larger compared to the other. And okay, so now this goes back to the FKG estimate. So, so this was sort of the basic FKG inequality. And I wanted to ask, uh, when was this sharp? And so this is the situation when it's sharp. So you take these two points, x1 and x2, you force, so, okay, so the height at x1, you want it to be at A, the height at x2, you want it to be at B. You draw the convex hull with these two points in the parabola. If the convex hull is such that there is a bit of a parabola hanging um, up between the two tangents loca tangency locations, that means somehow, the parabola acts as a barrier between these two events, which basically implies that these two events are somehow independent, forcing the FKG inequality to be sharp. Okay, and now you can do this same story with endpoints, as long as the sort of the tangency locations are such that you have a bit of a parabola between any two consecutive points, the FKG inequality will be sharp. Yeah, yeah. So this is sort of a two point version of the tent, right? Is that what you mean or? Uh -huh. I'm not sure. So what exactly is an endpoint version of the tent? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so, so the FKG inequality there will be, yeah. So as I just said, so this thing, you can take n points on this side. Yeah, so exactly. So you have, you have n, just take n points and take the parabola, take the convex hull. So that's the limit shape. And then if the parabola, if the tangency locations are such that you have a bit of a parabola hanging out between any two consecutive points, then this FKG inequality for n points will be sharp. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Other questions? So you should think of this figure as this parabola acting as a barrier between these two events, which make them independent. 
Okay, so in particular, this is basically what, so this basically somehow to some degree formalizes that. So you take this point, look at the tangency locations from this point on these two sides. And if this other point was below this line, then you know that these two tens will be somehow independent. So this is all the set of points at which, which X2 can take for which the FKG inequality will be sharp. If, if the point at which, uh, if the height at X2 was above this point, then these two, ten, these two points will have a straight line which does not intersect the parabola, which may, and, and in that case, FKG inequality will not be sharp. Questions? And so somehow this is sort of a slightly technical slide about general initial data. So again, this is not the most, um, this is not the weakest condition under which the result holds, but let's take any sort of initial data F, which is not too bad. So somehow the growth rate is somehow slightly smaller than a parabola with coefficient one. So the parabola carrier process of this um, KPZ height function, the parabola has coefficient one. So if the growth rate of the initial data is somehow slightly less than one, and it's also sort of not completely degenerate as at being negative infinity everywhere, the same results go through. Yeah, I mean, and this thing can actually be somewhat relaxed, but it's not super important. Okay, so, so, so basically I'm done with most of the results except for the non-integrable settings that I'll get to at the end, but I'll sort of talk about some of the key tools that get into the proofs of these statements. So this is a good time to ask questions if there are any. Yeah, so this, I mean, this, again, it's sort of important to see, see that the, the results are mostly about upper tails. We don't, this sort of, this method does not sort of give you any control on the lower tail. But uh, one might wonder whether this sort of method allows you to compute the large deviation rate function for the full height function. But still, it does not seem completely obvious how to do that. Okay, so the key tool is the following. So, so both the KPC equation at time t and the parabolic iterative process can be embedded as the top curve. And this is where the line ensemble comes in or the lowest index curve if you label them one, two and so on uh, of, a, of an infinite family of random curves. And so this was constructed in a couple of papers by Ivan Carvin and Alan Hammond. Um, so again, so basically, as I said, the curves look globally parabolic with some fluctuation and it turns out that you can actually embed them in a system of curves which all look like that, okay, which are ordered. And both ensembles actually enjoy a resampling property. Uh, what is the re resampling property? So, so let's again focus on the zero temperature case because the pulse temperature case is a slightly more complicated version of this. Okay, so, so let's say you have this system of curves and, and the point is the conditional distribution of the system of curves, if I condition on everything except for let's say a finitely many curves is given by non-intersecting Brownian bridges. So what do I mean by that? So let's say I keep the third curve, keep everything on the left side of this line, keep everything on the right side of this line and just erase the middle portion of these two top curves. And then I look at the conditional distribution given everything else. That turns out to be two non-intersecting Brownian bridges between these Switzerland endpoints, conditioned to not intersect each other and also to avoid the floor. So that's the conditional distribution description of this family of random curves. Is the property clear? Okay, so, and so the upshot is because each of the curves look like a parabola, at least in some limiting sense, um, the top line essentially looks like a Brownian, between any two points, essentially looks like a Brownian bridge conditioned to avoid a parabola. Okay, so that's what this leads to. Okay, so now we'll see, okay, so we're sort of repeatedly saying convex hull of multiple things. So it's sort of easy to see from this sort of uh, Gibbs property, how the convexity arises. So this Brownian bridge property implies that any limit shape should be convex. Let's see why that is the case. So suppose you have two curves, the top two curves look like this, where they're somehow concave in this region, okay? So let's say you fix the second curve and resemble the top curve, okay? If you erase that middle part and resample the Brownian bridge is essentially gonna look like a straight line with some fluctuations that are negligible. 
which means that in sort of in a limit shift sense, uh, the limit shift should look like this. So it sort of contradicts the initial assumption that the limit shift had some concavity. Is this point clear? Yeah, exactly. So because the Brownian, uh, Brownian bridge is le essentially linear between the endpoints up to some minor fluctuations, so which implies that any limit shape should be convex. That's essentially the key point. Okay. Um, and and so, uh, so in the six vortex model, a similar idea was termed as the tangent method by Koyomo and Fortier. And this was sort of rigorously implemented by Amola Garwal. Um, and again, um, the six vertex model can be thought of as a zero temperature model, similar to the ARE2 process, whereas the KPC equation is at a, for a finite time is a positive temperature model. Okay, so what are the remaining ingredients? So the key ingredient is this Brownian Gibbs property or the resampling property. The remaining ingredients are monotonicity in the boundary data. So these are all Brownian properties. Um, so suppose you have two Brownian bridge ensembles given by floor G1 and endpoints A1, A2, and B1, B2, and another Brownian bridge ensemble with floor G2 with endpoints C1, D1, and C2, D2, which basically means that you want a Brownian bridge from A1 to A2 and a Brownian bridge from B1 to B2, which avoid each other and also avoid the floor G1. So suppose you have two ensembles of this kind. So it turns out that this ensemble is stochastically more than this ensemble if the boundary data are ordered. If A1 was bigger than C1, B1 was bigger than C2, and similarly on the other side, and G1 was also bigger than G2, then this entire line ensemble will be stochastically dominating the ensemble on the right. Okay, so this is sort of a Brownian motion, property of Brownian bridges, which is monotone in the endpoints and the boundary data. So it's just order of, so there's a coupling between the left-hand side and the right-hand side, so that this function is on top of this function, and this function is on top of this function. Okay, so, and then the remaining ingredients are coalition inequalities, the FKG is already something that I alluded to, and the remaining key ingredient is this BK inequality. Okay, so this is, comes from this work of Vanderberg and Keston. Okay, so classically BK inequality was used in the sort of setting up for coalition, where you essentially, a statement would be of this kind, like let's say you have your standard percolation on Z2, and let's say you want two disjoint crossings from one side to the other, the probability of two decision crossings occurring is less than the probability of a single crossing square. So now the point that you want them disjoint means that one is, occurrence of one is sort of making the other one slightly less likely because you're taking up more space. Um, in this setting, um, although there is some connection that you can draw to percolation, the, the BK inequality, I'm like, we termed it BK inequality, but essentially the statement is the following. So suppose you have a line ensemble L1, L2 onwards, and look at this event that L1 is in some set A and L2 is in some set B. Okay, so you look at the top two lines. You want L1 to be in some set A and L2 to be in some set B. This property is upper bounded by the property that L1 is in A and L1 is in B as long as B is increasing. Okay, so what is the intuition behind this statement? So the intuition is that L2 is stochastically dominated by L1 because L1 is acting as a ceiling to L2, the law of L2 should be stochastically less than the law of L1. And this is why probability of L2 being in B condition on L1 is smaller than probability of L1 is in B. That's essentially the nature of the statement. Okay. Any, any questions about the inequality? Okay, so, when do I stop actually? Uh, 12.10, so I have 15 minutes-ish. Okay, yeah, so quick proof idea. So, so here is the first observation, which is a consequence of the inequality. So the upper tail for the top curve essentially leaves the second curve unaffected. Um, and so, so, second, so let's say this is the top curve. You want this to be somehow high, let's say at this point. That will not affect the blue curve. It will continue to look like a parabola. Um, we, because um, regardless of what this red curve looks like, the blue curve is bounded by an unconditional copy of the red curve. And because the unconditional copy of the red curve looks like a parabola, the blue curve, regardless of the shape of this guy, will continue to look like a parabola. Okay. So we want to use the resampling property. So, so this is the second curve. 
which we somehow argued that looks like a parabola, even condition on this large deviation type event. We know that the top curve at this point is a high. Okay, if you want to know what the limit shape is, we have we need to have some control on the boundary data because we want to use our resampling arguments, right? So somehow the key point is we want to rule out this sort of a phenomenon. So the second curve looks like a parabola. The top curve is high at this point, but what if the top curve looks like a straight line? We have to rule that out. So to be able to say if, if we can show that, regardless of the value being high here, the point, uh, at some sort of nearby points, the value of the top curve is somewhat low then we can allow our Brownian resampling argument to kick in to give us a tent type shape, right? So we have to essentially rule out this behavior of the top curve. And um, this is maybe too much detail, but uh, somehow it turns out that it suffices to show that at some point um, to the left of minus theta to the one half on this side and similarly on the other side, the top curve is below this blue line. So we want to show that the thing looks like a tangent we know it is high at this point. We want to show that there is some point to the left of this point and to the right of this point where this is below the tangent line. And this is, um, okay, there are multiple ways to do this. In the KPZ setting, we use some a priori tell estimates by let's say Corbin and Ghoshal to argue that uh, the probability of this point being higher than this is significantly smaller than the probability of this point being at theta. We compare the tail properties in some crude sense and you can get the spinning points. Okay, so that's roughly the nature of the argument, which allows you to get hold of these two points. And so, okay, so we are in this situation. We know that this point is high. This, there are points here, which are below the tangent line. And so we will try to derive this fourth third coefficient from this information. So by monotonicity, it suffices to push up. Okay, so let's, we will try to prove an upper bound for the moment. You can just push things up to the tangent line. So we know that the yellow points are below the tangent line. We had some monotonicity, so they can only increase the upper tail property. So we push them up. Okay, so this is where the points are. Okay, so now the probability of this figure happening is probability of a tent condition on avoidance of a parabola. You have a Brownian bridge, which you wanted to pass through theta. And then you also wanted to condition, you also want to condition on this parabolic avoidance. Okay, so. So you can do this computation. So you can just look at the unconditional probability of a tent or a Brownian bridge, and then you can divide by the probability you avoid a parabola. These two things are just standard Brownian computations. You can compute, and this, this window is of size square root theta. This height is like theta. So you can see where the theta to the three by two comes from, because this, this is a Gaussian of variance theta. It's going to height theta. So the probability is e power minus theta square by, sorry, yeah, so, so it's a Gaussian of variance square root theta. It's going to height theta. So you can do the simple Gaussian computation to see that it's theta squared by root theta, which is theta to the three by two. And the precise constants are also computable. The numerator is a two, the denominator is a two thirds. You get the four thirds. Okay, so this is how you get the four thirds uh, exponent uh, coefficient uh, for the upper tail. Okay, but, but keep in mind that this is an upper bound argument because we pushed the pinning points up. So pushing the pinning points up can only increase upper tail probabilities. So this gives an upper bound for the actual upper tail probability. Okay. So the lower bound, <clears throat> that's a bit more maybe mysterious. There are also probably other ways to do that. So, so see that if you want this tension to appear, uh, if you, so look at this point, which is Look at these two points where the tangent line um, to the parabola touches at zero. Okay? And already at these two points, the height above a parabola is theta over four. This is some very basic geometry. And so one way to sort of try to understand a lower bound for this probability is to use FKG inequality. So probability of theta at this point, we also use the fact that this is stationary. So the tail is the same regardless of where you are, okay? So, okay, how does that go? So you want the height to be bigger than theta here. So the first step is to ensure that the heights are bigger than theta over four at these two locations. It's stationary. So get a P of theta over four squared by FKG inequality. And then once you fix these two points, then you don't care about the parabola anymore. Then it's just a tent because you're already at a tangent line, but the parabola doesn't matter anymore. So you just have a tent computation just from 
for a standard Brownian bridge on this interval, and that gives you an exponential in minus theta to the three by two. Now you can iterate this. So P theta is bigger than P theta over four squared times this term. You can keep iterating that, and surprisingly, it somehow yields the right bound if you get down to the order one scale. You need some degeneracy condition because P as a function could be zero throughout, which you can sort of, sort of rule out um, without much work, and then this is what you end up getting. Okay, is the rough strategy clear? Now you can ask why is this working? Why is the iteration method working? It's because of this thing that the F, so we, we applied the FKG inequality at these two points, right? But from what we discussed, th there is no parabola hanging out between the tangency locations. So the FKG inequality in the leading order should be sharp, right? So to ensure that the heights are bigger than theta over four at these two points, we use the FKG inequality and we already provided a criterion for when we expect the FKG inequality to be sharp. And the, and the criterion was that if you draw the tangency locations, there is no parabola sort of hanging out between the two tangencies, tangent lines. And this is indeed uh, what governs the choice of these two points. Okay. Yeah. Then it is, no, so this is the parabola. This is the point here and this is the point here. If the tens actually don't interact, then it's sharp because they're independent. And so that's what we're doing here, right? So, so, you, so it's, I'm like, this is sort of a critical case where we have this. So still there is no tent, it's, it's still there is no parabola hanging above this tangency line. So that's why the FKG application here is sharp. Sorry, uh, question? Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah, 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 right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, so, so it, uh, okay, so this is roughly the proof idea, and so it, it's okay. So the area line ensemble was a zero temperature line ensemble. The stop line was the area two process, and so there was a conjecture by um, Sheffield and Oponkov, who basically said that any line ensemble which is stationary um, uh, up to this addition of this parabola and has the Brownian Gibbs property, meaning that this resampling property is there. Um, if it's extremal in the space of all such line ensembles, then it must be the area line ensemble up to some deterministic shift. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, it's sort of a delicate point actually. So there are many, so if you look at the set of all line ensembles with the Gibbs property, that's a convex set. You look at the extremal points of that set, and among them, look at the ones that are also stationary modulo this parabolic addition. Okay, and so if you if you look at those line ensembles, then the conjecture was that they should be the area line ensemble up to a shift, up to a deterministic shift. And okay, so it turns out that um, our results actually say something about this conjecture and to sort of, um, to actually see how that is so, um, sort of let's just summarize. So our results actually hold under these four conditions. So stationarity and the Brown and Gibbs property, two correlation inequalities like the FKG and the BK, three monotonicity in this sort of boundary data that is sort of a Brownian bridge property. And the four is some a priori upper tail estimates. Like that can be quite weak. Like, so you don't have to get anything. I'm mean, like, I think you do need uh, maybe exponential, stretch exponential, but, but you don't really care about what the exponent here is. As long as you have these four conditions, um, the arguments uh, will go through. Now, um, this top three things are already given for uh, the KPZ, line on, KPZ equation or the line ensemble and the parabolic area two or the area line ensemble. And, and these were the external, in, so to sort of, for four, we use ex external inputs which provided some crude tail estimates. Um, and surprisingly, actually, it turns out that all this hypothesis can be verified simply under the extremality assumption. I just tell you that this is a Gibbs measure, Gibbs, uh, this is a line ensemble which is extremal uh, and is stationary, then you can actually verify all, all, all the four properties. So, okay, first of all, one is not to be verified, one is a part of the definition. The line, we are only considering line ensembles that are stationary and have the Gibbs property. So we have to verify two, three, and four. So two and three can be verified for Brownian bridges, and then you can pass to the limit. Okay, and so the passing to the limit is where extremality is crucially used. 
If, for example, a correlation inequality, if you want to prove a BK inequality, you can prove that for finite Brownian bridges, but you cannot sort of prove it for the line ensemble unless the measure is extremal because you can, you can envision a line ensemble, you take the parabolic area two or the area line ensemble and just shift it by some random constant. Okay, you take the line ensemble and just shift it by some random constant, then that will completely ruin the BK inequality for the top two lines, right? So if the random constant has very fat tail, if it, that's high, then everything will be high. So you don't sort of see this sort of BK type inequality in that case. So this is that the extremality is sort of used. Proving an upper bound, a priori upper bound uh, on the tail, which is okay, I'm like, at this point, you don't really need sharp bounds as long as it's stretch exponential, that needs a lot more work, but still can be delivered in this sort of extremal setting. Okay. Yeah, so summary. So using geometric methods combined with resampling techniques, we can obtain sharp tail estimates for narrow wedge as well as a large class of initial data. The tangent method allows us to prove shape theorems. Um, can be used to explain upper tail asymptotics, but the but these kind of methods don't allow you to. I'm mean like at least superficially does not allow you any control on the lower tail estimates, which are actually quite important in many applications. So that stays open. And the last comment is the techniques are robust and should be useful to study other non-integral line ensembles as well. So ongoing work with Pietro Caputo actually studies. Um, Area tilted non intersecting Brownian uh, motions, um, which can be thought of as uh, arising from scaling limits of um, contours of uh, level curve, uh, contours of level sets in um, solid and solid models. So, in, in that case, um, sort of resampling arguments, monotonicity, correlation inequalities allow you to prove things like ergodicity of the line, line ensemble, um, correlation, decay of correlation estimates, and, and so on. And, and although this is sort of still not quite worked out yet, we expect the same exponential in maybe minus four thirds head to three by two tail for those sort of line ensembles as well. I think uh, I'll stop here and, and, and we'll be happy to answer questions. <clears throat> Since we stopped quite short of time, so I think we can take several questions. Yeah. So uh, the tail estimate is still not worked out, but uh, somehow using, um, um, let's say, just resampling arguments, you can, and monotonicity, you can, let's say, first prove, uh, okay, just to give context to other people. Um, so, so you can sort of, a natural collection of curves come from uh, looking at, let's say, can I prove it at the back C? So let's say you take a huge interval. And let's say you take a bunch of Brownian excursions. Okay, let's say um, K of them, K lines. Now, of course, um, just by fluctuation, uh, this thing will sort of go up and it will go up to infinity. So one way to make it tight is to tilt it by the area it covers. So let's say you, you uh, tilt this line ensemble by, uh, by a factor of this kind. So AI is the area under the ith curve. So this is the first curve, this is the second curve and so on, okay? And let's say lambda is some number which is bigger than one, which means it's really sort of forcing these things under gravity. So the lowest, the larger the index of the curve is, the more the penalty is. It's really gonna be sort of really pushed to the floor. Again, so this sort of area tilt actually makes this line ensemble, even though you can send K to infinity, it give, makes this family tight. Okay, so this thing will not blow up to infinity. And so, and then you can send N to infinity, so you can actually come up with an infinite line ensemble, which is stationary. Okay. Now let's sort of at least intuitively see what the tail behavior of the top line is, okay? So let's say I want it to be at height x. And let's say what is sort of an optimal way of it achieving that. So, okay, so let's see, let's say this height, this distance is s such that the effect of this is felt, okay? So what is the cost of this? What is the Brownian cost of this? This is e power minus x square by s, right? 
this is just a Brownian cast, but the area that it encloses has some penalty as well. And so that's e power minus lambda times, lambda can be thought of as one for the moment, but x times s, okay? So you want to minimize your, so s is something that you want to determine. So let's say you optimize this expression over s and you will see that s is like root x. And if you get that, then you will see that you have this e power minus x to the three by two tail. And, and it, it can actually sort of do such arguments to actually prove this kind of things. You can also prove other things about the top line being um, sort of um, ergodic and how the collision decays. So yeah, so I'm like, I'm happy to talk about this offline, but, uh, but yeah, this is roughly the sort of style of argument. Can you hear? Uh, yeah. Uh, this is a comment about a very small point you made. You said that uh, this Duma uh, Virag, they got tail bounds. You have uh, density bounds, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so. No, no, I mean, just recently I came to know Moksha and Yanisho showed me two proofs recently that Tracy Vidam distribution is actually lock concave. So tail bounds, density bounds are probably the same I thing. See, I see. Yeah, yeah. No, so for zero temperature, yeah, we have also received other comments about other methods that probably did not spell out uh, the density statement, but probably would be derivable from those as well. Uh -huh. yeah. Maybe something like this. I don't know if you had various convexity type things. I don't know yeah, if so your positive temperature has similar properties or anything like that. Yeah, potentially, yeah. yeah. Other questions or remark for Shishinde? If not, let's thank Shishinde again for this wonderful talk.